So I, I just figured out that all the poets are here, so we can begin. So uh, again, I'm Dave Salone, and um, I'm a poet, a visual poet. I work for West Central Behavioral Health as their director of development and community relations. And so, you know, poetry and art and the Ava Gallery and Art Center, as I wander around today, I realize it really is all about community uh, with all the various things going on with a collage workshop going on in one of the other spaces here and the various poets who are part of our community who are exhibiting here today. Uh, and I hope you'll have uh, take some time after this reading to sort of wander the galleries and see what's on the walls and enjoy it because, um, you know, it's really part of what the Upper Valley is all about and I think it's a very special place to be um, and it's uh, great to be part of it. So I would like to welcome everyone to the Ava Gallery and Art Center in Lebanon, New Hampshire. We're being filmed by CATV. Uh, we're here to celebrate National Mental Health Awareness Month for May. I think I'm gonna take this off. And, and I should mention to the poets, you guys can take these off when you're up here, but the Ava Gallery would like everyone masked um, when they're not at the microphone. So today's art exhibition and poetry reading share the same title, The Thing with Feathers, which is inspired and taken from uh, an Emily Dickinson poem that was published in 1891 that I'll read in just a little bit. Uh, the artists and the poets were all presented with the same theme before submitting their work, which was hope. What brings you light and lifts you up? And then they submitted and things were juried and we have the art in the lobby gallery uh, as a result and we have 10 poets here today plus guest poet Alice Fogel, uh, who's joining us, who's former um, New Hampshire Poet Laureate. Um, and I can tell you that the poetry came from everywhere. The art came from all over the place. Uh, art came from as far as California. Um, so this is, it actually reaches this notion of um, hope and what brings you light and lifts you up and um, notions of mental wellness uh, reach quite a long way. So during Mental Health Awareness Month, all of us at West Central Behavioral Health are basically shouting from the rooftops the message that mental illness and substance use disorder and crisis moments are all treatable. Uh, they afflict people uh, without being discriminatory. Everyone is susceptible. Uh, and we and our many therapists at West Central, our doctors, our nurses, our case managers, uh, our employment specialists, our health mentors, clinical and office staff. We want to help support people who are here in our community who are in need. And that's what we've been doing since 1977. Uh, we have um, a staff of about 130 people who cover uh, Lower Grafton County and then all of Sullivan County with clinics in Lebanon, Newport, and Claremont. And we also have uh, some residential facilities in Newport as well. As of this past January, we launched uh, a new initiative, which was part of the overall New Hampshire um, Rapid Response Initiative to send mobile crisis teams out into the community to meet with people who are in crisis in person uh, as they need it. And that happens 24-7, 365 now. And we've got that pretty well ramped up and almost fully staffed for the round-the-clock um, mechanism to work and that's really a big investment in the communities that we serve and um, lots of it work in the schools, lots of work with police departments, um, so lots of uh, sort of outreach efforts and um, it's being quite well received. So we know there are ways to help people. We know how to help people. What we need to do is communicate to them that we're available and to the extent that everybody here can sort of help us share that message um, so that people can reach out to us before they're in crisis, it's going to make a world of difference. So before I read Emily Dickinson's poem, um, let me just mention there's a growing field of neuroscience. Uh, always have to throw in some evidence-based research information because that's what we do at West Central in our, all of our treatment methodologies. Um, this this uh, sort of new section of neuroscience research is known as neuroaesthetics. Uh, its research is based on how our brains 
and our bodies react to aesthetic experiences like art, like poetry, music, movement, dance, et cetera. Uh, the similarities, interestingly, it, you know, with these are MRIs and other types of scans that they do to track how our brains react, also sensors of how our bodies react. Um, the similarities between visual art and poetry, specifically poetry when metaphor is happening, are quite close. Um, the findings show that um, these pleasing aesthetic experiences um, really sort of allow our brains to function in a way that secretes some of the feel-good chemicals uh, like serotonin, oxytocin, and dopamine. And our bodies react favorably when this happens um, by changes in our breathing and our heart rates uh, and even giving us goosebumps. So if we see or hear something, you know, it sort of gives us chills uh, in a good way. So, so this is a growing body of evidence suggesting that enjoying aesthetic experiences is good for our minds, it's good for our physical selves, uh, it's good for all of us. Art and poetry evoke feelings of happiness, calm, awe, relief, gratitude. These are powerful emotions that affect us in lots of ways. They help us deal optimistically and successfully with stress and anxiety uh, in ways that are healing. So um, that's a big part of what today is all about. You're all going to be healed somehow, some way, after you hear all the poetry that's about to be read. Um, so with all of that as a backdrop, I'll read Emily Dickinson's poem about hope, um, which has the thing with feathers in it. Hope is the thing with feathers that perches in the soul and sings the tune without the words and never stops at all. And sweetest in the gale is heard and sore must be the storm that could abash the little bird that kept so many warm. I've heard it in the chillest land and on the strangest sea, and yet never in extremity it asked a crumb of me. So that's Emily Dickinson. Now we have 11 poets lined up um, to share the stage with her. Um, so I'd like to introduce our guest poet and first reader, um, Alice Fogel, who's from Walpole, New Hampshire. She's the former New Hampshire State Poet Laureate from 2014 to 2019. And uh, one of the things that she did, among lots of things, was to um, implement the Youth Poet Laureate for the state. Um, she's written several volumes of poetry, and one about poetry as well, um, which includes how to appreciate poetry without totally getting it. Alice has been awarded the Nicholas Schaffner Award for Music and Literature and the New Hampshire Literary Award in poetry. She's been awarded a fellowship from the National Endowment for the Arts, and she currently works one-on-one -on -one with students with learning differences at Landmark College in Putney, Vermont. She also likes to get out and hike pretty often, from what I understand. And she tells me, and I ask all the poets this one question, and I'll, 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 as I introduce them in turn, I'll let you know what they said. I asked why they write poetry. Alice said, she writes poetry to play with the visceral, oral, primal, imagistic, rhythmic, emotive, structural, elastic, associative, effervescent tools of human language. So, it's a mouthful. <laughs> Alice, thank you for coming, and uh, please uh, join me in welcoming Alice Fogel. Thank you. Thanks for having me be here for this. It's, uh, it's multiple areas that are near and dear to me, mental health, art, and poetry. Um, so I have a few things I want to read at first just to introduce my thoughts to you. Um, in T.H. White's book, The Once and Future King, Merlin the Magician tells Wart, who is King Arthur before he's King Arthur, that the cure for sadness is to learn something. Because when we learn something, we're engaged, we're connected. Um, you kind of forget yourself in the best sense of that phrase. Um, 
and that's a kind of an attention that's, that's like love which is what Simone Weig said. She said that really paying attention to something is, is a form of love for the world around us, for nature, for others, for art. And what's interesting is that when we do that, we tend to like ourselves better as well, and we also feel more hopeful. I know that when someone's suffering from mental illness, they can't always find that place to turn their attention to. Um, I'm lucky to not be like that most of the time, except under, you know, maybe temporary challenging circumstances. But to get a little bit personal, I've spent my whole life around um, people who have um, struggles with mental health. I've made the calls to help people when they couldn't help themselves. I've gotten the calls. Uh, I've hidden the pills. I've hidden the guns. Um, my father, who was a first-generation American, lost most of his relatives in World War II. And he became a child psychiatrist who spent his whole life really trying to help children and families to, um, to be better, to feel better. Um, that didn't necessarily mean that his own issues didn't come out sideways at home sometimes. My mother and my sister, lifelong depression. Um, my ex-husband's personality changed um, over time, sometimes suddenly, sometimes gradually, because of unacknowledged mental illness and untreated. And my daughter has had to work twice as hard as her brothers to get where she's gotten because of her neuropsychological differences. And as Dave said, I work at Landmark College with students who have um, neurodiversity. Um, um, and um, even my dog has anxiety. <laughs> it's just the way, they, you know, they're just drawn to me, I think. <clears throat> So in order to understand all these people that I've loved, I've read lots of books. I've um, really studied up on like what helps people and also to understand not just them, but to understand my own responses to who they are and what happens in their lives. And I've learned how to forget myself. Although maybe saying learned is a little bit too intentional. It's more like I just need to. I need to have those times when I forget myself and find hope and connection. So um, really any, any passion will do, but for me, um, this is where art comes in. So uh, I talk about this in my book, Strange Terrain, that Dave mentioned that's about you know, appreciating poetry even if you don't get it. Um, I'll read this quote. Uh, according to a study published in New Scientist, billions of neurons per millisecond light up like Times Square on New Year's Eve whenever we read poetry. And it's the same with other arts, visual art, music, dance, sculpture, cooking, welding scrap metal, whatever it does. When we make things out of the materials of the world, we're absorbed and we share their life-affirming forces. We're speaking a kind of primal language. When we look at a piece of art or read a poem, we respond emotionally, viscerally, and that's a really fruitful place to start to think in new ways about who we are and how we can become whole. We can be transported and then return to ourselves changed. And maybe that's only for a moment, but I think that in every moment of unexpected inspiration, there is the possibility of more time, more surprise, more care for ourselves, less judgment of the unexplainable, more acceptance of our fate. So art is an obsession for me where my hope lies. Since I was the littlest kid, I've lost and found myself by making things and by putting myself in front of what others have made. Just on my way here, I stopped in Hopkinton at an art gallery that's showing this incredible exhibit of um, uh, quilts that were made as copies of abstract expressionist paintings. It's really stunning. 
So in, in my latest book, Nothing But, which I'm going to read a couple things from, um, it came from a time some years ago when I was um, injured and I couldn't walk for a while. And I, everybody would leave the house, kids would go to school. I'd sit on the couch and I would go online and look at art. I would just look at art for most of the day. And I'd write these poems in response to them. But even though that saved me that year, it's really not that different from what I've always done. I want to be taken, I want to be confronted, I want to be awed by art and what other people have made and the, other way, the ways that other people have found hope in their lives. I think that art, um, it takes me out of the mundanity of my little life and lifts me into gratitude and wonder. And if I don't get it, all the better. There's plenty of times in life where we you know, have to get things, we do get things, we have to make sense of things. And I'm so grateful for the times when we don't have to. And in fact, are better off kind of not necessarily understanding things. I think what art teaches me is that it's okay to not understand everything, including myself and those I live amongst. So um, I'm really grateful to be part of this. Thank you for inviting me to it. Um, I'm also really looking forward to what everybody else is going to read and to um, hear about the ways that other people find hope in their lives. So thank you. I'm going to read a couple poems now. So most of the poems in this book are actually um, more like just what happened to me when I was confronted with a piece of abstract expressionism and just where my mind went. So it's almost about consciousness, um, how, how looking at a piece of abstract painting kind of stops our stream of consciousness for a moment and we just go, huh? <laughs> and I just love that feeling. But every once in a while, amongst the poems in the book, there's one that's really just me talking about why I'm obsessed with art. So that's, this is one of those. Why I crave it is because it is devoid of therefore and is not giving any given path in some maze-like fingerprint of reason. Is not the wave bored with the moon, the shore, the depths, devoid of peace or proof? It is not awakening in me a certainty, not the outcome of prayer, never. The answer that is no outcome, no answer. Not the trance, the tongues, possession, ecstasy, the river, unable not to find, or not to find, but to enter the sea, that emptying that is at the heart of it, the, ne the necessary suspension bridge that falls from me as I step away from land, not the land, nor even the falling. Why not crave the pier? Because it reaches only from here and never gets there, because it takes me now as I am. So one more for now. These pictures up here remind me of this time when I um, was a farmer and I raised sheep. And this is about one of, one of those days. It's called The Necessity. It isn't true about the lambs. They are not meek. They are curious and wild, full of the passion of spring. They are lovable and they are not silent when hungry. Tonight, the last of the triplet lambs is piercing the quiet with its need. Its siblings are stronger and won't let it eat. I am its keeper, the farmer, its mother. I will go down to it in the dark, in the cold barn, and hold it in my arms. But it will not lie still. It is not meek. I will stand in the open doorway under the weight of watching trees and moon and care for it as one of my own. But it will not love me. It is not meek. 
Drink, little one. Take what I can give you. Tonight, the whole world prowls the perimeters of your life. Your anger keeps you alive. It's your only chance. So I know what I must do after I have fed you. I will shape my mouth to the shape of the sharpest words, even those bred in silence. I will impale with words every ear pressed upon open air. I will not be meek. You remind me of the necessity of having more hope than fear and of sounding out terrible names. I am to cry out loud like a hungry lamb, cry loud enough to waken wolves in the night. No one can be allowed to sleep. Thank you, Alice. Beautiful. And thank you for your candor with your life experiences and sharing how art inspires your poetry, which becomes art. It's this beautiful, virtuous circle. Um, uh, okay, well, we're now we get 10 community poets. Um, in addition to Alice, who will read a couple more poems at the end, but uh, I'd, I'd next like to introduce Pam Allen, who's from Barnard, Vermont. And in response to my question about uh, why she writes poetry, Pam said, I love being alone in solitude where I can break and enter meaning and taste the sweet salt tang of words that bite. Pam, thank you. Please. So when I got ready to come here today, I took out these orange earrings and I realized I haven't worn those in two years. I haven't been anywhere in two years. <laughs> this is kind of like, this is amazing. I'm going to put a little bit lower. Great, thank you. A few years ago, and it was around this time of year, it was like May the 9th or whatever, I was driving home on Route 12 to home in Barnard. And there was the most extraordinary sunset. It had rained before, and it was just glorious. It was one of those sunsets when you know you're alive and you're a part of something. And that's the poem that I submitted. It's called Zen Drive Home. An apricot, blood orange sky, Clouds having dumped buckets onto dandelions, eclipsed in haze like some finger-painting fantasy. Even the geese trombone praise and raucous gratitude, sunset more hallelujah than a Turner painting. And as above, so below, nine deer nibble the field, the postcard day going on with its quiet work into night, I into mine, recalling a childhood spring, how we swung topsy-turvy up in the air and down, vanishing wordless into Xanadu, yoked to a forever sky. Thank you. Thank you, Pam. I think I want to be there for a little while. Um, our next poet, I've known for a little while. We were in an MFA program together once upon a time at Vermont College of Fine Arts. He's from Woodstock, Vermont, um, Partridge Boswell. And uh, Partridge tells me that poetry is one of the best ways he knows of expressing his love for the world. Thank you, Dave. Uh, it's wonderful to be among you here today. Uh, Dave, thanks for inviting me, and Ava, thanks for having us all. This poem begins with an epigraph. A British teenager is slowly emerging from a coma nearly a year after being hit by a car, and he has no knowledge of the coronavirus pandemic. Reuters, February 2021. Aphasia. 
that you can't talk yet, can only blink and smile, yes and no, both for perhaps, makes perfect sense. You'll find words later, or not, to correct journalists and historians' attempts. For now, what can be said? The shit hit the fan. The car, the child, the world collided with itself for a while. We were comatose, then woke, tidied up the mess, and moved on. Your disbelieving eyes widen as if to say, sea shanties, really? We told you the water was rough. You'll just have to trust us. Overnight, a winding, cabooseless train arrived and left. It's all the same and for the best. What's this world coming to if not change? For good or ill, a keelless rudder against the waves. You wake at noon to afterthought, masked family milling about the bed, sensation returning to your limbs. One day soon, sun will glance the dewy pitch of your face, and a word like joy will come fluttering out. Just wait. No need to force it. The unthinkable takes time to process, and the clocks are still broken. Truth is, you didn't miss much, if anything. Another year at home, glued to your phone, arguing over whose turn it is to take out the trash. Some things are hardly worth forgetting. Take it slow. Let your body and mind get acquainted like new and ancient friends who come in from the cold, sit down for tea, and gaze out the window at something long lost and familiar to them both. A buried sled, or mitten orphaned from its string. A name, perhaps, blooming through the melting snow. Thank you. Thank you, Partridge, for aphasia and your performative poetry. Uh, if you ever get a chance to hear Partridge read poetry, sing poetry with music, uh, it's an experience and a wonderful one. Uh, our next community poet is from Castleton, Vermont, Debbie Franzoni, who said, in response to my question, I began writing poetry when I retired 13 years ago and found that rather than running by, I had time to be stopped by a moment, sometimes long enough to open it up. Well, thank you. It's, um, it's wonderful to be here <clears throat> and see so many people that um, we did move from here to Castleton, so it's just fun to be back. And this is an amazing event. Um, my poem is called Dawning. I do live, by the way, in a very remote place. In the winter, there is no one else but me. And <clears throat> an indoor cat I call a feral cat. An indoor feral cat, because I never see it. Dawning. Everything is wrapped in a milky mist, so I cannot see the pole that stands at the side of the road or its heavy wires suspended that bear the weight of a lung. And one small bird that sings as if all life springs from it through the fog. To communicate to people through music and words those things in my head that I can't express any other way. Don, thank you for coming. And thank you for having me. Um, when I looked at this, I wondered if it was really a poem about hope, which is a theme. And for me, it definitely is, because I think one of the things we all hope to be able to do that's so hard for anybody is to make connections to other people, uh, communicate what's going on in our heads. 
Uh, this is called What's There. Put my glasses on here. What's There? All the things I never noticed. The red roof on the barn by the river. The rusted wheel on the lawnmower. The iris blooming in the front lawn as if someone had planted it there. How you touch your finger to your lip before you turn the page of a book. Nothing has changed, but my eyes are learning how to see. Thank you, Don, very much. I think I'm learning how to see, too. You're helping. Um, and, and, you know, from Castleton and from Woodstock and from, you know, parts further flung, people are coming, you know, to read a few lines of poetry, and I, I just, it always, amazes me how powerful this stuff is. Uh, our next poet um, is from Hanover, Marjorie Matthews, uh, who tells me, I write poetry to capture and convey to others moments that resonated for me. Marjorie, thank you for coming, joining us. I asked for Dave's permission to preface my poem with just a little bit um, to say that until a couple years ago, I was a NAMI volunteer, NAMI as in, as in the National Alliance on Mental Illness. And um, it was a great privilege and an honor. And I got to learn about some really amazing things that are going on. I also learned about some of the great need there is in our community. And one of the programs I learned about was crisis intervention training for police officers. Thanks to um, Matt Isham of the Lebanon Police Department, uh, he began training the Lebanon Police Force with help from Donna Stamper, my fellow volunteer in Fernami. Pat, I don't know that you were involved with that, but she was involved with the drug courts. Um, and Matt made sure that the officers in Lebanon got trained in how to respond in an evidence-based, best practice way to mental health crisis situations. And then about, that was several years ago, and then about five or six years ago, um, Philip Kasten came to Hartford and was their new police chief. And he came from Silver Spring, Maryland, where he had witnessed the benefits of crisis intervention training and so he saw to it that every one of his officers, every member of his staff, got trained. And this is a 40-hour training program. And then he opened the doors to all the, the police departments in our region. And today we have a massive number of police officers who are trained to respond in ways that de-escalate crisis situations and not only prevent death, but, but lead to good outcomes. And so that is what gives me hope. As a volunteer and as a family member who has dealt with mental health issues for a long time, I take hope in systemic change, the things that actually make the system better, that make the system better for everyone. And um, there is now a new hope, as Dave referenced, the mobile crisis response teams, which we are very hopeful will be effective we hope there will be adequate funding and um, workforce to make that a reality. So instead of calling the police, family members can call for providers to come to their homes and deal with the crisis at, in, in the moment that it's happening. So that is our hope for the future. I reference in this poem that I'm gonna read an incident that I got to witness in West Lebanon of a young woman in crisis and I watched the Lebanon police force respond appropriately and effectively to that situation. Blessed are we. In the honeyed light of Good Friday Eve, packs of young people jog past my window. Arms pump, ponytails fly, Long, lean legs rise and fall as if not even gravity could bind them to earth. So brief, so light is the tap of feet on tar. 
They churn the winter dust, clogging roadsides. Their exuberance, something more than hope, more than optimism. They radiate certainty of a life abundant. Trust, the finish line is theirs. The gold, a wafer. Redemption on the tongue. Rejoice, O Jerusalem. Rejoice for them and all creation, perfect in intention. In the glaring white of parking lot lights, a single woman, also young, also lean and long, stands with arms outstretched, cascading blonde hair shrouding her face, her body tilting toward asphalt. She sways, teeters, to either side at a distance meant to assure they mean no harm. Officers stand, arms extended, ready to catch her if she crumples, ready to cushion her if she falls. Pray for her, O Jerusalem. Pray for her and all creation, perfect in intention, yet dwelling in unspeakable sorrow. Appreciate it. You appreciate your sharing that with us. Um, I will also say that your hope in the systemic programs that are going on is, is a good thing because it's happening. And in fact, with, we've been, we've been with West Central Behavioral Health, we've partnered with the Lebanon Police Force uh, as part of the mobile crisis response teams. You may know this, you're nodding your head, but uh, for everyone else, we've spent a lot of time with PDs and in schools throughout Lower Grafton County and Sullivan County to really help people realize that by calling the toll-free number for the New Hampshire Rapid Response Crisis Hotline, it gets them to a trained clinician who can talk to them, who can listen, who can help them understand what's going on in their heads or with their bodies at the time, and then connect with one of our clinical teams, mobile crisis response teams, to visit with them in person and um, help them. And uh, you know some of the some of the statistics that that I'm privy to suggest that one of the things that we talk about is ER diversion rates, which is diverting people from having to go to an emergency room and instead be part of a community mental health treatment program. And the, the diversion rates um, are north of 85 uh, percent since we've. Uh, implemented the mobile crisis response team. So it really makes a big difference. Uh, and get, you know, the point is when you go to an emergency room, you never know what ha what's gonna happen. It's not necessarily going to be the best path. And if, if people can be treated in the community um, by therapy uh, with a crisis response team, with people who care, um, it really makes all the difference. Um, so I could go on, I won't go on. Um, but it's, it's powerful. I'd next, next like to introduce um, poet Marjorie Moorhead from Lebanon, New Hampshire, who um, has told me, quote, I write poetry attempting to understand the world and my place in it as it unfolds and moves around us and to be in community with others who've chosen to engage in the creative process. Marjorie. Thank you. Wow, now I can see all these people. It's wonderful. Thank you. I'm so happy to be part of being here with you all. I have a pretty short poem that was written in January of 2021 called Another Chickadee Poem. All pandemic long, I've been watching chickadees, observing their swooping flight to the feeder from scraggly branches always taking turns, no collisions, no fights. Swoop in, take a seed, 
swoop out. I could watch them all day, like flame of a campfire, or a baby in a crib, looking up with sparkling eyes, existing in some joyful world where knowledge of hateful things hasn't entered. That shining pool of innocence, that the irises like doors to infinity, inviting you back in. Thanks, Marjorie. I can tell you it resonates with me. I spent so many hours at home during the pandemic working, and I think the only thing that kept me going was watching the birds at the bird feeder. Um, you know, it was, and it's really cool to watch how they sort of interact with one another. They're very nice to each other. It's amazing. There's hope for the human race if we all watch birds, I guess. I don't know. Um, OK, thank you. Catherine O'Brien is our next poet. She's from South Sutton, New Hampshire. And Catherine has told me, I write poetry because poetry brings beauty, wonder, and imagination to the darkness. Catherine. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for calling us a swallow. <laughs> I, I consider that <laughs> um, a compliment. and. Um, my husband and I have spent the last four years being down in Alabama during the winter for about four months, and we also watch the wildlife and birds a great deal. So um, what brings me hope and light um, are poets like Elizabeth Bishop, scientists with courage like Rachel Carson, uh, artists like Walter Anderson, and these are all embedded in my poem. Um, we learned about so many different wildlife, white herons, brown pelicans that have come back, made a comeback. Flounder has made a comeback. And it, I just really feel people like Rachel Carson, who did her work on DDT, um, reading and learning about them gives me hope and light. So this is In My Pelican Dream for Isabel Garza Walker. I have an epigraph. It is approaching the magic hour before sunset when all things are related. It's by Walter Anderson. He's um, an artist who painted nature and patterns in nature uh, from Ocean Springs, Mississippi and he struggled with mental illness through most of his life. I was born without feathers, down by the fish houses, a water bird with a long brown bill, an orange pouch of translucent skin, scooping up clouds and small fish, sometimes a carp traveling with my flock. I could glide long distances along the coast of my imagination. You fell in love with my webbed feet and waterproof feathers. I spoke the mysterious language of mermaids and blue heron. My favorite foods, anchovies, frogs, and snakes. When I arch back my head way back, to swallow, the fish river light comes through me. How I love to stretch out eight feet of wing over the Tensaw Delta swamps. Humans called me ungainly. Still, I fly with my own cert certain grace, landing on the pier cross, swooping down from up high, almost without a sound, to balance each eye open, wide, and bright, set inside a ring of black seashells, set on each side of my head, holding the curve of slender neck, poised above the waves, waiting and watching for the magic hour. 
and um, <laughs> I, I also wanted to um, thank Literary Arts North for publishing that poem. And it's part of what they call a seed constellation poem, where you take a line or two from another poem. So the opening line I wanted to credit um, down by the fish houses is from an Elizabeth Bishop poem. So thank you very much. This is wonderful. Thank you. Thanks, Catherine. Thank you, Catherine. I think um, I'm going to think about us as swallows scooping up clouds um, from this point forward. Uh, but yeah, I think I think the the aesthetic experiences that we uh, have when out in nature, you know, again, as I listen, it gets me. Gets, I think there's something happening up here and through my body as I listen to you read, and it's, it's wonderful. Uh, let me next introduce Judith Taylor. Uh, Cole, I forgot Cole. I'll get to you. You're coming back, Cole. We're coming back to you. Judith Taylor um, from Woodstock, Vermont, who tells me that writing poetry is a full body experience registered by all my senses. At times, it can feel like dancing. Thanks, Judith. Close, but no. The business of a boy 19, a man, is not his mother's, no. Her job is to create a here to return to, if and when. Her trust and his will find the way. For now, each lives there, he in his and she in hers, though sometimes on the stairs she hears him murmur but dares not ask, what, have I missed something? His hum, a fine wire fence posted, keep out, marks a border she is bound to honor. So they manage, do okay and better than okay when he gets work at the old smoke shop, a place to stop in, buy mints and gum and lottery tickets, say hey, and admire the fragrant boxes, their ornate locks, their ornate labels, gilt hinges, tiny locks. Manning the register, stocking shelves and sweeping up he grows, calm. Locking up, he comes home late, mornings, sleeps late and leaves for work. One morning, on her desk she finds a gaudy box with gilt hinges, tiny lock, an ascent like memory. Startled, she says nothing and fills the box with magic markers. Another morning, another box, then more. Barely able to contain herself, she arranges the boxes in tiers on shelves and fills them with small objects, spools of thread, ribbons, buttons, pins, change. For a week or two, they move through the house like guests at an inn, until on the stairs she smiles, reaches out. Defiant and contrite, he turns on her, says, give them back. Ah, yes, so, one by one, she empties the boxes, and then, with abandon, almost like flight, she builds at her door a fragrant tower that he dismantles, box by box, tier by tier, and carries to the gravel driveway. Her back to the window, she hears the snap and fracture like tinder catching. She turns and sees him sweeping up and filling the barrel with splintered shards, twisted hinges, tiny locks. 
Later, in the garage, her hand on the door, she stops, mingled with the mineral stink, oil, rubber, rust, cement, the scent of cedar, a memory, a promise of joy. Thank you, Judith. You gave me goosebumps. It's for real. Uh, our next poet is from Norwich, Betsy Vickers. Um, Betsy's always very direct. Um, <laughs> when, I, when I asked her why she writes poetry, um, she gave me an initial response and then a secondary response. The initial response was, because I can't not write it, exclamation point. And then came back and said, and because I'm drawn to its spontaneous and crafted qualities, which combine the inspirational and welling up with intellectual, disciplined, considered puzzle solving. Betsy. So my, um, I had trouble digging out a poem that I thought ended with hope. Um, and then, you know, well, all of us have been struggling for a while. And then I decided this really was about hope. So my next birthday, um, I'll be 80. And this just seems astonishing to me. I, I just, and I don't want to dwell on the negative aspects of that. I certainly feel less than 80. Um, but this poem is called Aging. Aging has its way of narrowing connections, winnowing those you've known, loved, made love with, those you traveled and discovered with, those you ate with again and again, talked books and ideas with, sent reams of letters back and forth, prunes out once close friends when their own dwindling lives draw them away, family laces through, and the amassing dead died, not solely in wars, not solely from illness, died, falling from skies, in crashes, from suicide, from the unique accidental. In this battering depletion, is it possible to become jaded, to die of infecting ennui, a listlessness that loiters off stage in the wings of aging? Better, until the end, to suck the marrow from every last brittle ossifying bone. <laughs> Thank you, Betsy. <laughs> I, I, I want to be here at your age reading poetry like that. Um, before we return to Alice as our guest poet, I'd like to, and this is a little bit out of order, but maybe we're saving the best for the next to last. Um, uh, from Castleton, Vermont, sorry, from Enfield, New Hampshire, is Cole Asude, uh, who has told me, I write poetry to make sense of a nonsensical world. Cole. I'm Cole, you know the drill. Hope is the page not yet written, nestled in a nook in your mind. It is defying the daily drudge, tragedy, scandal, stimulation, ad nauseum. To hope is to cross your fingers behind your back to proclaim this is temporary to ignore the obvious, that everything ends, embracing beginnings instead. To hope is to forgive yourself, to forget regrets, to keep a promise to yourself, another day, another chance. Hope is the tea not yet drunk, drinks unheard, stories untold. To hope is to hoard, to hold time close to the chest, cramming all the joy you can into an arbitrary sentence. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Cole, for coming today and sharing that with us. Uh, I think let's all continue to hoard hope as we hear and savor two more poems from our guest poet, Alice Fogel. Alice. This has just been awesome, listening to all this. So for this short poem, I just want you to picture standing in an art gallery, looking at um, the paintings on the wall. Um, and maybe like each one of those pieces of art is an island. In time when at the brink of one island, a sudden surf's swelled current closed over me, my feet sinking into a gallery of sand, and my eyes kept to the dark keening of what I couldn't understand. I stopped for one second, asking what and why, and looked, and the suffering was only one of a thousand things still there. When Dave asked me to pick out some possible poems to read that have hope in them, um, I realized that I write a lot of poems about hope, but most of them aren't actually hopeful. Um, so they're, uh, most of the ones that are hopeful are not directly about hope. So, um, so I'm gonna read a more recent one. It's called, I Won't Let Myself Go to Sleep. Somebody asked me why I stay up so late, and I said, well, I don't really know, let me figure it out, so I wrote this. <laughs> I won't let myself go to sleep because it's the slowest way I know of staying alive, this not going to sleep and not going to sleep, this timeless space between days so little happens so constantly here, and after the day, after one thing, after another, the night magnified and all still, small, because this not sleeping is being adrift, a floating in silence on the sleek lake, a turning between the boulders piled with pines and bright leaves sinking through air onto the water and behind the eyes where shores are far in the distance. There is no counted hour, and minutes are flicked waves that shade to blue-black as the moon feathers low over the bow. Because I can't stop listening for the sound of a mountain I can sense hovering from the darkness, the river, the rain, an answer, someone's joy because I'm here. I'm awake and a whir with expectation because I don't want to miss more love or more loneliness or the voices that shed their deaths between the islands of dreams because not sleeping and still not sleeping soaks my skull soft till its listening is the same as bones, as waiting and not waiting, because sleep's a loon that hasn't risen yet. It is late and it's early, and I am alive in the space I fill with the boat of my body, immersed hour after unstruck hour in not going to sleep, the shape of the dark fitting close against the hull, perfectly holding the outline of me, a light still on inside, because I want to hear it when the world touches my door with both its wet palms and leans with all its weight into the room. Welcome, I will say, welcome. I am not asleep. <laughs> Thank you, Alice. I need that poem <laughs> many nights. But thank you for being here. Um, I think having you has inspired me in a variety of ways. Uh, I want to go home and write, uh, but I want to go out and experience things that, that will inspire more of that stuff that we call poetry that uh, comes out of me from time to time. Um, 
Before we move on to drinks and snacks and art and enjoying more of the aesthetic experiences that surround us, um, I want to turn to Sherry Boraz, who's the executive director of AVA. Um, Sherry holds a BFA from the School of Art Institute of Chicago, and I've known her for a number of years, um, have enjoyed her art. She's a fiber artist. Um, she paints with very detailed embroidery. Uh, and I've learned she's influenced by Jungian symbolism and iconography found in ancient and biblical cultures. And oh, by the way, she's also a manager and a fundraiser and someone who can help organizations grow and thrive. And that's why she's here at AVA. Um, but also, I suspect it's for the love of art. As of this past November, um, Sherry became the executive director at AVA, so I'd say still new, um, still figuring things out, uh, I think in a good way. Um, and I know that she is hoping to make art much more accessible to the public than ever before. And I certainly applaud your efforts um, so far and going forward into the future to do that. So Sherry, if you'd like to come up and say a few words, thank you for hosting us. Thank you. Thank you for coming here, and thank you, Dave. Um, I've had to improvise since my printer and the borrowed printer and computer that I used would not print up my speech. <laughs> so thank you to thank you to all the part all the poets who have put a fine point on fine art. Thank you sincerely. Um, and thank you to all the artists who contributed to our uh, lobby show. Um, uh, it's called The Feather, what is it called? The Thing with Feathers. The Thing with Feathers, pardon, my phone won't turn. Okay, great, okay. The Thing with Feathers. So, and I'd like to thank Dave, who deserves uh, special thanks for his matchmaking skills in bringing us together for the second year in a row. Um, and to our, our sponsors, who were already mentioned, but always deserve they just are the heart uh, and soul that helps us function, all of the nonprofits, several nonprofits in the area. That would be the Jack and Dorothy Byrne Foundation, Geocon, Mascoma Bank, the Mount Rushmore Foundation, West Central, and Doug and Leslie Williamson. I'd also like to recognize um, Sam, Sam Eckert, our, our exhibition manager, who's done such a uh, impressive job of organizing all of the shows that I've been witness to since she's taken over, um, as well as the rest of our staff. Um, and um, I'm, Ava is especially pleased to offer free community programs throughout the week. Um, and throughout the year for you, for anyone that you know to take part in. Some of them include our community arts open studio, sometimes referred to, often referred to as chaos on Saturday mornings, where you can bring the little person of your choice to come and make an art project and we get to clean up the mess. So that's a, one of our free programs. We also have Outreach, which we developed during the pandemic. and. Um, on Friday mornings, you can watch and learn from the comfort of your monitor, be it at home or at work, um, as a professional artist demonstrates their techniques. We also offer senior art on Thursday mornings for senior citizens or our elders, and Fiber Arts Open Studio every Tuesday morning. And those are just a few, a few of the things that we offer routinely. As Ava approaches our 50th anniversary in 2023, I hope that you will help celebrate with us throughout the year. Now, I have a special request for you. I want you to visualize this gallery, the one that you're in, this room, this building, and the gardens surrounding the building. I want you to visualize this place as your refuge. This is where you can come anytime, Tuesday through Saturday from 11 to 5, to just be here with yourself or to meet someone just to sit and talk. Um, I hope that you will take advantage of it. And I want you to know that Ava belongs to you and it wouldn't be here if it weren't for you. So thank you. Thank you for being here.
Thanks so much, Sherry. Thank you, everyone, poets and artists and community members, for being here today.